cannot thank the organizers because I'm one of them. So yes, it's a bit um, how come I give the first talk in this conference, but uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, actually, Rafael, a good friend of mine, insisted a lot, and uh, I have to learn how to say no. I failed, uh, I accepted to give this talk. So I thank uh, Rafael <laughs> for uh, giving me this opportunity to present my results. And um, so he was, uh, in particular, he was curious about this topic of almost quantum correlations. So this is why I chose this topic. And uh, so it's a, a one hour talk. So I will be presenting, I mean, I would say the first half of the talk will be, I would say rather introductory. So it may be that you know many of the things I'm going to tell you, but then it will uh, gradually move. And at some point uh, towards the very end, my talk is more for specialists. I mean. Uh, Although I, s I think uh, everyone will be able to follow, or at least this is my what I hope. So I guess also since it's a one-hour talk, uh, it's also a good idea if you interrupt me anytime for questions. Okay, so feel free to do it. And uh, okay, so this is almost quantum correlations. It's um, let's say in my group we do several things. Uh, it's a group on quantum information theory, but we are also interested in quantum foundations. And I would say this is the part that is more connected to. Uh, uh, quantum foundations rather than, qu I mean, we use tools from quantum information theory, but our main motivation is uh, from a quantum foundations point of view. Okay, just to, uh, to explain the, the formalism. So all my talk is to be about the characterization of correlation. It's flat, okay. It's okay, so by this, what I mean is that I'm going to uh, deal so I have uh, the two boxes. So I will deal with uh, several observers who have access to some systems, and they can make different measurements on these systems. So for instance, here, I represent two parties. But uh, all my talk is going to be, all my results in general are going to be valid for any number of parties. But for simplicity, let me just focus on two parties. So there is Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob have the possibility of making m different measurements on these particles. I, for simplicity, I take the same number of measurements, but it can be different. And then they collect the, the results, and I will label the choice of the measurement by x and y, and the results by a and b. And what I will call correlations is just the vector of uh, the conditional probability distributions of observing outputs a and b when you perform measurements x and y. So all my talk is going to be about this object. Just for you to understand what is this object, it's just a vector of probability. So here, when Alice and Bob perform measurement one, or used uh, input one, okay? So then they will collect the different uh, results. So they will have probability of getting result one for Alice and one for Bob, or result one for Alice and two for Bob, up to result R for Alice and R for Bob. All these are probabilities. They are positive numbers for the combination of inputs one and one on Alice and Bob. So they are positive, and they, sum they have to sum up to one if you sum over the results. I guess this is clear to everyone. Good. And then, of course, you have the same uh, well, the same similar vector of probabilities for another combination of inputs where Alice uses x equal to 1 and Bob uses y equal to 2, okay, which is here. And of course, these are positive numbers, they sum up to 1. And then you have a similar vector of r possible positive numbers sum up to 1 for all possible combination of inputs, and there are m square possible combination of inputs 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, so on, up to mm. Well, I guess no questions, okay, very, everything is very clear. Okay, so this is the object, and uh, up to this point, the object is very clear. I mean, there is nothing, I didn't say anything about f the physics of, of my object, because this is just mathematics, okay? This is just uh, the probabilities that you observe when you make an experiment. I didn't attribute any meaning to these measurements. I don't s I'm not saying anything about these boxes. So now I will, we are physicists, I will use physics, okay? And I think you all know this, but I think it's a very nice concept which is the fact that uh, if you have physical principles, they impose limits on these objects. So a priori, if I don't use any physics, this vector of numbers, it, the only thing I will impose is that these numbers have to be positive and they have to satisfy all these normalization conditions. Now, on top of that, I will say that these numbers come from a physical theory or they have to obey a physical principle. So this is known by many of you, but uh, I think this is a very important uh, concept. It's somehow, this is the concept that is behind m my talk, okay? The fact that if you have some principles, this gives you limits on the correlations, on the probabilities that you can observe between different objects when making measurements. Okay, so this is uh, 
Again, now I'm being quite basic. Right? So you have the first constraint is not single line correlation. Th by this I mean that what a subset of parties uh, see is independent of the inputs used by the others. And the motivation we give for that is that uh, if it was not the case, these parties, for instance, party two, could use uh, his input to communicate uh, to uh, Alice. Everyone knows this. I assume I can go. Okay. Then we also have classical correlations. These are the correlations you can write a la Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen uh, model. So there is a lambda that tells uh, to each box how to behave in a deterministic way. So the output in every box is a fun deterministic function of uh, some given instructions represented by lambda and the input. Okay, and then some correlations. I will say that some correlations are classical or have a, an EPR model whenever they can be written in this form. Everyone knows this. Good. And the uh, third set is the set of quantum correlations. So I would say that some correlations are quantum whenever I can find a Hilbert space in which there is a state and some measurements for each of the observers or each of the boxes that I can combine with a tensor product, compute with the Born rule, and then they, they give me these numbers. Everyone knows this, so this is a set of quantum correlations. The important thing is that I don't specify the Hilbert space in which these objects act on. Okay, so it, I'm I would say that some correlations are quantum whenever I can find a Hilbert space in which I have a state and measurements. So since the Hilbert space is unspecified, I can take this state to be pure, because if it was mixed, I can always purify into a larger space. And I can also take these measurements to be projective, because if they were pure VMs, I can always purify into a larger dimension. Okay, so this is what I'm demanding here. I will demand that these, these are projectors, you see here. I demand that for the same measurement, the x is the same here and here, and different outputs, they give zero. And for the same output, they give the same object, so they are projectors. So these measurements, I'm projective, uh, they are projectors, they are projective. And I'm not losing any generality because I don't specify the Hilbert space dimension. Sorry, but I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone in the audience follows me, okay? So what we know is that the set of classical correlations is a polytope, so it's a convex set with a finite number of extreme points. So you see here, I always apologize for my drawing, but uh, this is what the best I can do. So then there is the quantum set, which is again convex, is the red one, it's larger than the classical set, and then we have the no-signaling set. So what I'm representing here in this two-dimensional space is the space of these correlations, okay? This in principle are very, Complicated, well, not complicated, a larger object. It was this vector of m square, m square, r square uh, numbers. I'm representing in this two-dimensional space, and I try to represent all the properties of this set. So this is classical correlations, this is quantum correlations, and this is the no-signaling correlations. And what we know is that these inclusions are strict. So we know the set of classical correlations is smaller than the set of quantum correlations. The set of quantum correlations is smaller than the set of no-signaling correlations. So I zoom in this part. I'm here. Why do we know the set of quantum correlations is larger? It's because quantum correlations violate a Bell inequality. Actually, a Bell inequality is just this hyperplane that divides between classical correlations and quantum correlations. So this region here is usually called non-local. Not everyone likes this terminology. This is what I'm going to use. The only thing I'm saying is that some correlations are non-local whenever they violate a Bell inequality. Okay, so Bell inequality is the boundary between classical correlations and non-classical correlations. And there are some quantum correlations that violate a Bell inequality. So the, the set of quantum correlation is larger. This was this result by Bell. And this was proven, it's already in some papers by Tzidelson, but perhaps it was uh, better emphasized by Popescu and Rodlik. So it proved that there are correlations that are compatible with no signaling, so they don't lead to any faster than light communication, but you cannot achieve them by uh, making measurements on quantum states, uh, tensor product measurements, on local measurements on a quantum state. Okay, so this is why we have this inclusion. Is there anyone who didn't know these results before? Okay, I'm sorry for you. Okay, this I'm not going to do, okay, because everyone knows, just to represent the CHSH. So we have the CHSH that represents that, okay? So the CHSH is just a hyperplane that you can see the space of correlations here. And uh, uh, ju just by changing this number, somehow you can see that the hyperplane, the slope doesn't change, but you're just moving the, the hyperplane. So CHSH equal to two is this facet and classical correlations are below this facet, okay? We know that quantum correlations, they can get up to two square root of two, so again, this is this hyperplane, and this is quantum correlations are below this uh, hyperplane. And we also know that you can go up to four with the so-called popescu rodlich box, 
Uh, and of course, these points are not quantum because we cannot go beyond two square root of two in quantum physics for the CHSH bell violation. This is why we know that there are no signaling superquantum correlations. Okay. So now I will just spend some time in the in the first problem, which is related to almost quantum correlations, which is very interesting. So what is the interesting set for us in general? Well, we are quantum physicists, so we want to characterize this set, the set of quantum correlations. So we want to understand this boundary, which correlations are possible within quantum physics. Because maybe, I mean, understanding what are the correlations po that are possible within a theory tells you the power of this theory for some information processing task. Okay, this is one motivation. I would say even since this is a meeting on quantum foundations, I think it's even interesting from a very speculative point of view in the sense of asking whether at the moment we have the tools to falsify quantum physics. So imagine you make an experiment and you, uh, see some cor I mean, and, and you see some correlations when you make measurements on two quantum particles and your quantum model fails to reproduce these correlations. So does it mean that quantum physics is wrong? Well, no. It just means that your model is wrong. So if you, strictly speaking, if you want to falsify a quantum explanation for uh, an experiment, you have to falsify all possible quantum explanations. You have to go over all possible Hilbert spaces and states and measurements that could explain a given experiment. So basically what you want to do is the same as what Bell inequalities implied for classical models. So with Bell inequalities you could falsify all EPR models. So I would say that if you want to falsify quantum physics, you have to falsify all quantum models. So you have to have tools to characterize this quantum boundary. Because if you have the characterization of the quantum boundary, you can say whether something is outside the quantum boundary or not. So I see two motivations to characterize us. One from a quantum information point of view, the power of quantum physics to establish correlations among distant parties. And a second one, more quantum foundation, is like provide tools to falsify quantum physics. Okay, this is very speculative. We, at the moment we can explain everything with quantum physics, but we could think of a day where we have some data that we cannot explain with quantum physics. So, this is a very difficult problem to characterize this quantum boundary. And uh, there are some tools, and I will tell you about some tools that we developed in my group already more than 10 years ago with uh, Miguel Navasquez and Stefano Pironio. So the problem is very simple. So again, think of you being an experimentalist, going to a lab, preparing several particles, making measurements on several particles, say two, three measurements of two, three, four outputs, and then Okay, let's see, now assume that you make two measurements of two outputs and you get this, uh, you measure this probability distribution. So whenever you make the measurement 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, you get these numbers, and whenever you make the measurement 1, 1, you get these numbers. So they are positive, they sum up to 1, they look very innocent. So now you are an experimentalist and uh, you talk to your uh, theory colleague and you ask the theory colleague to reproduce these numbers with quantum physics. And the theory colleague says, Oh, I will going to try with qubits because it seems that it's a qubit distribution because you have two outputs. Okay, the theory is failed. You cannot find a model for these numbers. So what do you do? You can say, well, you know, I thought I was measuring polarization, but I realized that polarization was coupled with frequency. Why don't you try with set system of dimension three? And the theory says, good idea. He goes back to the office. He tries to reproduce the number. He fails again. So does this mean that quantum physics is wrong? It's just that the theory is didn't explore all possible quantum explanations for that. Okay, so basically what you want to know is whether these numbers can be written in this form for a given Hilbert space. Okay, so what we found, we found a, a method that is now called sometimes MPA for Navasquez, Pironio, and me. I'm sorry. And uh, so basically we want to ask, answer this question, whether some numbers can be written in this form where uh, these are projected measurements. Now look, I changed a bit the notation because it would be for what I'm going to say later. I don't demand that the tensor product here, but I just demand that the measurements commute. Okay, so it's not so important for this talk. So rather than demanding that these are commuting measurements, I will demand that these are commuting measurements on my uh, quantum state. Okay, so now I will explain you how that works. Again, it could be that some of you know, but I will tell you the idea. So the idea is, uh, I think it's, it's a very good idea, it's not my idea, it was mostly Miguel Navasquez who had this uh, intuition. So assume for a while that you know the state and the measurements. You don't have them, but let's assume that you have the state and the measurements. Now what you can do, you can take these measurements and you can take products of these measurements and you can construct a set of operators. Now you will see how you construct this, but let's say you take all the measurements by Alice, all the measurements by Bob, and products of three measurements by Alice and Bob. And you construct this set X. And now you define this matrix which is given by the 
uh, the expectation value of elements from this set with the state. Okay, so this is what you do. You define a matrix and the rows and columns of the matrix are labeled by the the operators in this set and you compute this expectation value and this gives you the matrix element. I'm not going to do it, but it's a one line proof that to show that this matrix is semi -de positive semi-definite. So let me just give you an example, okay? So imagine you define this X as the measurement operators by Alice plus the measurements operator by Bob. So remember the rows and columns of this matrix are labeled by these elements of this set. So I will have all the measurements by Alice followed by the measurements by Bob and this will label the el matrix elements of this matrix gamma for this set X. Now what you have to put here is the expectation value of Psi with Say here in this part, one measurement by Alice and one measurement by Alice. Here, one measurement by Bob, one measurement by Alice. Okay, do you follow what I'm doing? Okay, and we know that this matrix, if you have everything, it's positive. But do we have everything now? No. We have this. So if we had these numbers here, we could complete this matrix, but we don't have all these, num all these operators instead. We only have these probabilities. So we are, going, we are trying to complete this matrix with the information at hand. We don't have this, we have this. So look, this part here, this is, you have to put the expectation value of Psi with a measurement by Alice and a measurement by Bob. But these are the probabilities you are measuring. So all the matrix elements here can be completed with your information. What about here? Okay, and the same here, okay? This is the same matrix here, because you have, again, Alice and Bob. What about the part here? Well, you cannot, okay? Because here, sometimes, you have elements that involve a measurement by Alice with another measurement by Alice. They don't commute. You don't have access to this information when it, in the experiment. So you leave this unknown. But you have some elements. For instance, if you look at the diagonal, you have the expectation value of Psi with twice the projector. So this is the marginal probability. And if you look at some elements here, sometimes you have the same measurement, different output, so you know this is a zero. Okay, with information at you can put some zeros here, you can compute the diagonal. Now, what's the idea? If this is quantum, you can give values to this unknown so that the matrix is positive. So this is what you have to test. Okay. Well, this is the question. Can you find uh, values for the unknowns coming from non-commuting measurements so that the matrix is positive? And the nice thing is that you can, define, you can answer this through, through something called semi-definite programming. So this you can answer easily, while characterizing the quantum boundary is difficult. And this step is what is called the step one, and you can do this trick, you can do for any combination of products of measurement operators. Now you will see one, okay? So step n is, is defined by the set of products of n measurement operators. So I will give you an example here, the step one plus a b that will be useful for what follows. So I put the measurements by Alice, the measurements by Bob, and then I put the product of one measurement by Alice and one measurement by Bob. This is why it's called step one, which is the previous one, plus AB, because I take one measurement by Alice and one measurement by Bob. I can still contract this matrix, try to construct this matrix. What I put here is what I defined before. You see, I only have measurements by Alice or measurements by Bob. This is the matrix I defined before. And here, again, you have some non-trivial constraints. So sometimes you have some zeros. If you look at the diagonal here, it's psi with twice the measurement operator by Alice with twice the measurement operator by Bob. So again, it's the probability. So here, you have the probabilities. But I hope you, I'm not sure if you follow everything what I'm saying, but you can construct these matrices, try to construct these matrices. You'll always put some information here depending on the probabilities. You will put some zeros. You will have many unknowns, and you ask whether there is a value for these unknowns so that the matrix is positive. So the idea, okay, you do it for just the measurement operators by Alice and Bob, products of two measurement operators, product of three, products of four, and if the points are quantum, you can always complete these matrices to something positive. If at some point you cannot, then the, points, the point is not quantum. Okay, this is why it's a hierarchy. Every time you run a test, if you pass the test, point, the correlations may be quantum. If you fail, the correlations are not quantum for sure. And the nice thing is that you can prove that the uh, hierarchy is convergent, which means that if some numbers are not quantum, they will be detected at some point in the hierarchy. Okay, maybe it was a bit too much, just to have a pictorial way of what I'm saying. What we are doing, we are approximating the set of quantum correlations from the outside. So the first step in the hierarchy gives an outer approximation to this set, the second step gives another out approximation, and so on, so on. And this 
sets can be characterized through SDP, so through semi-definite programming. This is easy, while this is difficult. So if a point is not in gamma 1, it's outside gamma 1, for sure it's not in quantum. If a point is in gamma 1, it might be in quantum. And then you run gamma 2, gamma blah, 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 blah. Okay, so if you take these numbers, you can see that they are not quantum. Okay, so the theories can go, run the hierarchy, and prove that it's not quantum. So you could win the Nobel Prize. Okay, so this is just an introduction to uh, explain a uh, few things. How much time do I have? Okay. Uh, so it's 11, uh, okay. No, it seems I have 11 minutes, but probably I have 41 or... Uh, okay, okay, okay. Good. Okay, I was a bit confused, yes. Thank you. So now I will go to almost quantum correlation. Okay, this is a paper we published three years ago with uh, uh, Miguel, uh, Yelena Gurianova, and Mati Hoban. So I will to characterize this, and I was telling you that there are two motivations, quantum information theory and foundations. Now let's focus on this part. Okay, so I think that the, in this nice paper where Popescu and Rodlik uh, realized that you can have points beyond quantum physics that do not contradict non signal in principle. So they ask a very uh, interesting question, which is, why don't we see these correlations in nature? So let's say before quantum physics, I think it was very natural to expect that all correlations had uh, an Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen explanation, because this is, I mean, to me, Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen, they just and Bell, they just formalized the standard way of understanding correlations. We know now that quantum correlations can go beyond that. So is this the ultimate boundary, or we can expect to have correlations beyond quantum physics? Okay. So, so can we expect to get some correlations here beyond quantum physics? Can we expect that one day someone will make an experiment and will find correlations here? So what is the answer we can give at the moment to this question? Well, what we can say is that, well, we don't expect that because these correlations here are incompatible with quantum physics. Well, it's a possible answer. Is it satisfactory? Well, quantum physics explains everything, but in the past, classical physics explained everything, and we understood that it was not all correlations had a classical explanation, so we can expect that something like this may happen in the future. So at the end, I mean, if you are strict about it, the answer we can provide is that, okay, we know that these correlations are not possible because we cannot find a Hilbert space and state the measurements on this Hilbert space that we combine with the Born rule and get these numbers. So it's not super satisfactory, I would say. Okay, you may argue that, okay, we have a theory that explains everything we see, and this is quantum physics, so this is why I don't expect to find numbers here. But again, this is what you could have said in the past for classical physics. So the question was whether you can have another explanation that tells you why we, can, we may not expect to find correlations in this part. And then I think there was a very uh, nice result by Wim van Damme that I'm going to explain later, that some uh, explained or tried to motivate that Maybe a reason why these correlations are not possible in nature is because if you had access to correlations here, you could do things from an information point of view that seem quite crazy. So it's not that you prove that these correlations are not possible, but based on information arguments, you prove that it's implausible to expect correlations in this region. This would be nice, okay? So you wouldn't be referring to uh, Hebert space operator or things like this, but you'd be saying, no, I expect this correlation not to be possible because correlations were possible, then a given information principle uh, would be violated. This was more or less the logic. I will explain a bit abo abo more about this. Okay? And then there was, some there was somehow a sort of race to find uh, information principles to characterize the quantum boundary. Okay? People were just, I even have an information principle, so people were posing information principles to characterize this boundary. So again, the, the, the goal is like, okay, maybe there is a, a reason not based on Hilbert spaces, but based on information uh, arguments that tells me why this region is not possible and then tells me where this boundary is that I can characterize with the previous hierarchy but now I will characterize based on more qualitative arguments. So what are the principles? Well, I'm not sure if this list is exhaustive but uh, these are principles that have been proposed. Okay, I think the first principle was proposed by Van Damme and I, I like it a lot. 
So uh, what Van Damme proved is that if you had access to the point here, which is this Popescu and Rorlitz box that violates CHSH by four, then communication complexity uh, would become trivial. So what is com communication complexity? Okay, let's imagine that uh, I have to come back here to Natal to see my friend Rafael, and we have to arrange a date for my So I will have my agenda, he will have his agenda, and we'll have to exchange some communication to find a possible day for my visit. So I will say, okay, I'm free on, uh, I don't know, uh, 13th of September, are you free? And he will tell me, no, why don't you come on 2nd of October, and I will check my agenda. So we have to find a... Uh, uh, a match between our agendas to organize my visit, and we are distant. And of course, we understand that we have to exchange some communication to achieve this task. So communication complexity is basically that. So I have a list of inputs, X. Rafael has a list of inputs of, uh, of information, Y. And we have a, to solve a function of X and Y remotely. So we have to compute F of X, which is my information, and Y remotely. So there is a trivial strategy, which is I send x to Rafael, he computes f of x, y, and he sends the result. Of course, you understand that I have to send a lot of information. So combination complexity wants to understand how much communication you have to exchange to compute a function that depends on information that is uh, between two, sh not shared, is distributed between two parties. And what happens is that some functions are easy, some functions are difficult. So for some functions, you have to exchange a lot of communication. And we expect that to happen. So we expect that some functions will be hard to compute. So I will need, actually for some functions, the best strategy basically is to send my list of uh, data to, to Rafael. So what Van Damme proved is that if you had access to this point, then communication complexity would become trivial. So we, would need, we wouldn't need to exchange an amount of communication that depends on the size of my inputs. Just by exchanging a finite amount of communication, we could solve this problem. Okay, do we expect this to happen in nature? No, it's, this would be super nice, okay? We would, could solve problems remotely just by exchanging a few bits. So as we don't expect this, we don't expect this to point to be exist in nature. This was the logic. And then some other people improve the result and they prove that even having access to some correlations in this part here, communication complexity would be true. And then the, the logic is, as I expect, I live in a world where communication complexity cannot be trivial. I expect these correlations will never appear in the future. Okay, it's just whether you like it or not, it's up to you, but I think it's a strong argument. Okay, then there were some others. So there is uh, information causality by uh, Pavlovsky and co workers. So what it showed somehow is that by sending a one meet, so if I get two bits, I cannot send, I cannot give to Rafael the possibility of learning either of the two bits by sending one bit. Okay, it's not so important. So there is a principle that it also looks more sort of natural. Then there is the principle of, of uh, microscopic locality by Navasquez and, and Wunderlich. So basically what they say is that there you can define a sort of classical limit for many copies of a state so that you recover classical physics, so you don't violate any Bellian inequality. And we even define one principle that we call local orthogonality that is connected to something called consistent, exclusi consistent exclusivity in contextuality. But it doesn't really matter. So there were some principles. So for instance, information causality and microscopic locality are able to get this point, the zero-sum point, proving that CHSH cannot be larger than 2 squared of 2. They don't get the quantum boundary, but they get this point there. But for instance, Navasquez and Wunderlich, in their paper, they were able to prove that this principle does not give quantum correlations. Okay? So we know that this is a nice principle, but it doesn't give quantum correlations. OK, this is what I was saying. Okay? So Information causality, microscopic locality, give the Silson bound so they can prove uh, that you cannot go beyond two squared of two for the CHS evaluation. But uh, Miguel and uh, and Wunderlich, they prove that microscopic locality cannot give quantum correlations because it's equivalent to the level first level of the MPA hierarchy I told you about. So what's the problem with these principles? That you, I mean, the problem is that you can invent as many principles as you want, but then prove that these principles give quantum correlation, and this is very hard. So usually it's very easy, well, or relatively easy, to prove that a principle is satisfied by quantum correlations, because actually you define it thinking about quantum correlations, so usually you can prove that it's satisfied by quantum correlations. But then you have to prove that gives only quantum correlations, and this is very hard. Or on the contrary, you have to prove that it's incompatible with quantum correlation, and this is also very hard. 
So I think in this sense it's remarkable remarkable that Miguel and I don't well Wunderlich, I don't remember his family name, his first name, were able to prove that macroscopic locality does not give quantum correlation. So this is usually very difficult. So to falsify a, a principle usually is very difficult. So this is why we had all these principles that were there as potential candidates to single out quantum correlations. So now I will tell you about almost quantum correlations, okay? Because we proved that many of these principles don't give quantum correlations. And for that, I remind you again. <coughs> Sorry. I remind you again about the definition of quantum correlations. I would say that some correlations among n parties are quantum whenever I can find a state, and measurements that combine uh, give me the state. And what I will demand is that okay, this is a vector in a Hilbert space. These are projectors, and I demand that projectors for different parties commute. Okay, I remember I replace the tensor product by commutation. Okay, it doesn't it's not such a big thing here. So here you see I change J denotes the party, X denotes the choice of measurement, and A denotes the output. So here I'm demanding that the operators for different J's, J and J prime, commute. So these are operators by different parties. So this is what I'm demanding. So now almost quantum correlations, the title of my talk. But it's something that looks very similar. This is why it's called almost quantum. So you just take the same equation here. Okay, so you demand some correlations that can be written as quantum measurements acting on a state. So you see the same. You see one normalized vector, normalized vector. Projectors, projectors. So what's the difference? For quantum correlations, you demand that the measurements commute. For almost quantums, you only demand that the measurements commute when acting on the state. So, say a measurement by Alice and Bob acting on state psi, AB acting on state psi will be the same as BA acting on the state psi. But this doesn't mean that the A and B commute. It just means that A and B commute when you act with them on the state psi. Okay, this is the only difference. So I take quantum correlations, I relax them by just demanding that these conditions are only valid when acting on the state. So I'm just permuting the parties here. This is what I'm, plot I'm trying to encapsulate here. Okay, this is the definition. Okay, it might be some here, but what is the nice thing about this is that you almost have everything uh, that you have for quantum correlations, okay? So if you think about it, in quantum correlations, you know, when you have access to correlations, it's like you have mostly information about the measurements acting on the state. It's not that you have information about the measurements in general. You only have information about the measurements acting on the state. So I just keep the commutation for the measurements when acting on the state. So it has a lot of similar properties, this set, as quantum correlation. That was our intuition. Yes. Yes, this is more or less, okay, the intuition. So clearly, okay, clearly this set you expect to be larger than the quantum set, okay? So what I'm saying is that some correlations are almost quantum whenever I can find a state and measurements, there is no tensor product here, okay? So measurements that I can combine in this way and they just commute when acting on the state. This is a mathematical definition. And you expect it to be larger than the quantum set because I'm, Condition three is relax. And actually, we proved that this set is indeed larger. So what we did, and it was mostly, I must say, Miguel. So we took this set, and we took all the proofs for the principles showing that the principles were satisfied by quantum correlations. And instead of taking quantum correlations, we were replacing quantum correlations by almost quantum correlations. It just happened that the proofs were also valid for almost quantum correlations. So some of the mathematical structure of this object is so similar to the quantum correlations that you can take the proofs for information principles, replace quantum correlations by almost quantum correlations, and the proof still holds. So if you have a proof showing that uh, quantum correlations have non-trivial communication complexity, you take the proof, but it's not that simple. But you take the proof, 
you somehow remove quantum correlations, you plug in almost quantum correlations, since you still are dealing with states and measurements that commute when acting on the state, bim, 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 non-trivial communication for almost quantum correlations. You take local orthogonality, you remove quantum correlations, you plug in almost quantum correlations, tick, 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 it's satisfied by almost quantum correlations. Okay. Okay, so because of this similar mathematical structure, we could prove that almost quantum correlations satisfy all known information principles, and we couldn't prove for inf the proof. We couldn't show the result for information causality. So the problem with information causality, for those who know, is that it, it uh, involves um, an information quantity, so it has an entropy, and entropies are not so nice to deal with. Okay, so this is why. Okay, in principle, you could have taken quantum correlation. In almost quantum correlation, but uh, okay, we were not able to have a proof for that. Okay, so it's open, but it's clear that almost quantum correlations, for instance, have non-trivial communication complexity. So we could have a world with uh, super quantum correlations, but still with non-trivial communication complexity. This is possible now. What we, you can do is you can try information causality and see if you can violate with uh, almost quantum correlations and use the existing numerical results for information causality, and we couldn't find any violations. So at least numerical evidence, I wouldn't say it's strong, but the numerical evidence we have is compatible with the possibility that uh, almost quantum correlations satisfy information causality. But this is open. And the nice thing also is that what is almost quantum correlations? I was telling you as the difference with quantum correlations, but actually it corresponds to level one plus AB of MPA. You remember what I was showing you MPA? I was telling you that a first relaxation where you have measurements by Alice, measurements by Bob, and the product of two measurements, one by Alice, one by Bob. I don't know if you remember this, but this level corresponds to almost quantum correlations. So it's, if I give you some numbers, it's very easy to understand whether they have this um, uh, expression, you only have to run the level 1 plus AB of our hierarchy. So level 2, you also include uh, products of one, two measurements by Alice. So in a 1 plus AB, you only have measurements by Alice, measurement boss, and cross terms, yes. No, this is, you can generalize this to the multiple type case. Uh, okay, the, the thing is that uh, some definitions are really bipartite, like communication complexity. Okay, I guess people have studied the, the, the rates of bits that you need to exchange to solve a, a function in a distributed way, but uh, I think most of the principles have been defined in a bipartite. If, yes. So, actually, our motivation to define local orthogonality was to have a principle that makes sense also in a multipartite scenario. This is why we define local orthogonality in, in uh, just to deal with multipartite scenarios. And local orthogonality in the general multipartite case is also satisfied by almost quantum correlations. So in some cases, you can go to the multipartite scenario. And of course, the definition is given by, by a, for any number of parties. And you can run an SDP, which you can see as generalization of 1 plus AB that also tells you about this. I guess so, yes. But uh, I'm not sure you have to include also 1 plus. So ABC you have to include. Now whether you also have to, you mean 1 plus AB plus AC plus BC plus ABC? Is this what you? OK, I would say, but uh, now I don't remember, that is 1 plus AB plus AC plus BC plus ABC. But I would say you should include ABC, yes. Otherwise, you won't have the commutation of three possibilities. But I can I have to figure out, okay? Okay. So the implication then for information principle is that none of the existing principles, with the possible exception of information causality, is able to single out the set of quantum correlations. Okay, so did, at, at, uh, we were happy with this result and we said, oh, could it even be that nature could be almost quantum? Okay, so could it be that there is a thing that explains me almost quantum correlations, because all what I'm saying is just about the correlation structure of a theory. I'm not saying whether, I write this with states and measurements, but I'm not saying that the, your theory is based on these states and the measurements are given by these operators. It's just a mathematical description of these numbers here. So with me, we wonder whether you could have a theory, maybe a weird theory, that you could explain almost quantum correlations. Okay? 
Because also, for instance, when I was giving these talks to some audiences, sometimes there were experimentalists coming to me saying, oh, this is very interesting. Can I go to the lab and test your theory? Can I look for almost quantum correlation? And of course, I, I couldn't. Because I, I cannot say, all what I can say to the experimentalists is go to the lab, prepare this state of light, which is described by quantum physics, and make these quantum measurements. So you are going to find quantum correlations. So we're trying to think, okay, maybe we can think of a weird theory, but where I can define states and measurements. I can even perhaps dream of propose a quantum experiment. Uh, not a quantum, an almost quantum, ex an almost quantum experiment. So that was sort of a very crazy idea, but we tried to see if we could make sense of this. So at some point we tried to make a, so we work on two directions. So try to make a theory or try to prove that there cannot be such a theory. And some of we uh, recently found some arguments telling you that maybe there won't be such a theory. Okay, and this is because almost quantum correlation violates something called the no restriction hypothesis. Okay, this is something that we did with Belen, uh, Yelena, and Miguel and, 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 and I. So again, the goal is that let's construct the theory for quantum correlations. Okay, maybe not the theory. I don't. It's not so important you have an evolution, but I want to have a theory where I give states and measurements, and I define probabilities as measurements acting on the state. That gives me almost quantum. So the framework we chose for that is uh, the framework of general probability theories. There are experts in the room, like Howard and others, that know much more than me about this. So what is this framework? So I'm sorry if I say something wrong. I'm not an expert on that. But in this framework, states are defined by vectors of probabilities, vectors that define the probabilities of outcomes of measurements. OK, this is a long sentence. But just to say that sometimes you have something called fiducial measurements that describe the state of your of your uh, of your system. So for instance, in quantum physics, you can define a d-dimensional system by giving the probabilities of some measurements that allow you to make tomography. So you uh, specify the outputs of, for a qubit, you give me the outputs of sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. This is like specifying the state. Okay, this vector of probabilities is the vector psi, say, for a qubit system. And you can prove, uh, well, I mean, you demand, because it makes a lot of sense, that the set of possible state is convex. Okay, so you have a theory where you have a set of states that are given by vectors, and you demand that this uh, set is co convex. I mean, you demand because of operational reasons. It's not, uh, you can justify this. So what are measurements? Measurements are uh, given by what is called an effect. So an effect is just a functional on the vector that gives you a number between 0 and 1. So it gives you a probability. Okay, so this linear functional acting on the state gives you a number between 0 and 1. This is a probability. And if you know for a, a, a vector space, this defines the dual of the set. Okay, that will denote by S asterisk here. Okay, so this, an effect is an element of the dual. And then a D outcome measurement is specified by a collection of D effects so that you ha they are normalized. Okay, this is like a measurement. And an effect is an element of the dual. Okay, but it can be a subset of the dual. Okay, so an effect should be something that gives you a number between zero and one. This defines the dual, but I'm not saying that everything that is in the dual is a possible effect of my theory. Well, the non restriction hypothesis that whatever that can be a possible effect should be a physical effect. Okay, so you don't make any restriction. You don't give any reason why something that could be a measurement shouldn't be a measurement. So I think this is very natural. It's just a statement, but I find it natural. So for instance, I like something that Miguel told me, like this no restriction hypothesis is like what you use to, uh, what people use to uh, figure out the existence of black holes. So black holes was a mathematical solution for the Einstein equations. And before knowing whether they existed, you believe that they existed because it was a mathematical statement. So you think as mathematical as possible, I believe physical, it exists physically. Okay. So I think we use it a lot, okay? Even in particle physics, you, okay, when you will reach this range of energies, you will find this particle because it's implied by SU3 symmetry, and then it happened, okay? So you see something that is mathematically possible which is in your mathematical framework, and you give physical reality to that possibility, and then you check it, okay? So here I'm saying, okay, I'm not making black hole physics, but I'm saying just that if something is possible in your theory, I assume this measurement is valid. And this is the neurostriction hypothesis. Okay, so, good. 
you know the answer for that. No, that it's, there is a, so in some theories, you may say that some measurements are not possible because you violate a conservation law. Yes, it's, uh, thank you for the remark. Okay, so let's say if there is no strong physical reason to say that some effects are not possible, you assume that they are. Okay, so this is the result: is that if you have for any GPT theory that satisfies these non-exclusion hypotheses, uh, no GPT theory satisfying these hypotheses can reproduce almost quantum correlations. So, if you believe that GPT is a nice framework to describe physical theories in general, and they have to satisfy these non-exclusion hypotheses, then almost quantum correlation is not possible. Okay, according to that clock, I have ten minutes. Ten? Okay, good. So maybe I. I'm going to try to give you the idea. This is the most technical part of my talk. I'm sorry. Okay. I think I hope you can follow me. Okay. But this is. I still need uh, what it remains of your energy for that. Okay. But I like it. So this is why uh, I try to tell you why we can say these things. Okay. So. Okay. The the main idea of the proof is that we saw that this hypothesis that I'm going to write as no N R H implies many constraints of the correlation structure. Even if I don't have the theory, I can say things about the correlation structure. So I'm not, I'm not saying that there is a... I don't know anything about the theory. I'm only imposing that the theory satisfies this hypothesis. Okay, so as I said, the correlation set is convex, because the theory is convex. So it's always characterized by Bell inequalities, hyperplanes. So I take one Bell inequality, you see, I only change... I don't change the slope, I only change the constant. So I know that this Bell inequality... I can also redefine the, the, this, the Bell inequality is just a linear functional of my probabilities. So, okay, this is the space of probabilities of my of correlation of my theory. This is a hyperplane, so a linear functional. And I arrange the thing so that it is bounded between zero and one. I can always do that. I call this a normalized Bell inequality. Okay, so this is zero and this is one. And in my theory, this functional takes value between zero and one. Now, what are the, these probabilities? These are local effects acting on my quantum state. Okay, so I'm just replacing the probabilities by what my GPT demands. I don't have this information, but I assume that it should be explained by GPT, so they should be local effects acting on my quantum state. And this is true for any sets of local measurements of any states, because this is a valid Tillerson type bound for uh, this Bell inequality. Well, if this is true for any local states and any state, this is an effect of my theory. Okay, because it gives me, it's an element of the dual, sorry. Okay, because it gives me a number between zero and add one when acting on any state of my theory. And now, because of the no, um, I made a mistake here, because of the no hypothesis restriction, before known as no restriction hypothesis, it's an element of the dual, so it's an effect. Okay, so here's where I use the no-restriction hypothesis, sorry. Just to state that this element of the dual has to be a valid measurement of my theory. So any of these Bell inequalities is a way of mapping local measurements into a joint effect. Okay, so a all normalized Bell inequalities map local measurements into joint effects. So you, I take these uh, local effects and I have a joint effect acting on the joint state. And the nice thing is that the, the action of this joint effect on the big state, I can compute from the action of the local measurements. Just to give you an example in quantum physics. So you take the Tillerson bound. Okay? This tells you that the CHSH Bell expression is bounded between minus 2 square root of 2 and 2 square root of 2. Okay? So from that, you can rewrite everything. And this operator is bounded between 0 and the identity. Okay, because this number can be at most, when acting on the state, 2 squared to 2, minus 2 squared to 2, so you can see that this number is 0 and 1. So this is a POVM element. It's positive and it's smaller than identity. I can complete it into a two-output element. Okay, because it's between 0 and 1, because this number is between 0 and 1 for any possible state. And I can compute the action of this measurement on any quantum state through the CHSH Bell inequality or through the computation of the local measurements acting on the state because it's a linear functional of the local measurements. So this is what I'm saying here. So these inequalities map local measurements into a joint measurement. 
or join effect that I can complete into a two outcome measurement because I can say this is an effect and the other effect, the other output is one minus the effect as we do in quantum physics. Do you have any questions about this? I hope it's more or less clear. Okay, so you have Bell inequality, you take local measurements, and these local measurements through the Bell inequality are mapped into an entangling measurement, let's say, in your theory. Now, you take n bipartite Bell inequalities, with that with are defined by this vector of numbers, okay? So they define via this argument m joined two outcome measurements because every Bell inequality gives me an effect, and I can complete with the complement. So I have a two outcome measurement. If I have m bell inequalities, I have m joined to outcome measurements. So this I can see it as a single box where I put an input which takes n possible values and I take a binary output because I have n possible two output measurements. So I can see it as a single box when I make n measurements of two outputs. Now take one more bell inequality that now has n measurements of two outputs. So what I will do now, the m measurements of two outputs, I will see them as joint measurements on two particles following the previous Bell inequalities. So I'm not sure if you understand what I'm doing here, but I'm taking a Bell inequality between two parties in quantum physics. I'm trying to violate a bipartite Bell inequalities by preparing a tripartite state and making entangling measurements on two of the two particles. This you can always do. So I'm doing the same with these boxes. So when you have two particles against one particle and you try to violate a bipartite Bell inequality, you can make any entangling measurements on the two particles on one side. So I'm doing the same in my GPT and I can define entangling measurements because I'm imposing the non-restriction hypothesis. And I, this I can do through all bipartite Bell inequalities. Well, now I understand that it might be hard to follow, but I, I hope many of you follow the logic of the argument. So this means that this initial Bell inequality, when I use this box that has m inputs and two outputs, I can replace again by some other Bell inequalities, but in the end it's just a tripartite Bell inequality that I take by combining two part, two, several bipartite Bell inequalities. Okay, so using this logic because of the non-restriction hypothesis, I can see that by taking many bipartite Bell inequalities, I can give you a tripartite Bell inequality. And this inequality simply follows from the initial bipartite Bell inequalities and the application of the no restriction hypothesis. Okay, this is a summary, okay? So I assume you have something that can be explained by a GPT satisfying the no restriction hypothesis. Then you can take many bipartite Bell inequalities and define a tripartite uh, uh, Bell inequality just because of this no restriction hypothesis. And this is more general. So this is telling you that no restriction hypothesis implies constraints on n plus one uh, correlations from n party correlations because I can always combine these joint effects and grow and grow and grow. I think this is, to me, it was a nice message. This is why I spent some time explaining you all these things. It's a bit boring maybe, but uh, I hope you understand. This is what you have to understand, okay? So this hypothesis, even if you don't have the theory, just by making this hypothesis, you can get constraints on the correlation structure of your theory. Now, let's go back to almost quantum correlations. So we can easily derive uh, these Bell inequalities for the theory because this is the same as computing serial sum bounds and we can do it through SDP. So we, I can give you, for almost quantum correlations, since I can characterize the boundary, I can easily compute these normalized Bell inequalities. I can put the uh, lower bound and the upper bound for the inequality easily. So then we took several of these inequalities numerically and we combine them to define a new tripartite Bell inequality. Supposedly Bell inequality following the non-restriction hypothesis because then we show that this new inequality was violated. So this means that the non-restriction hypothesis cannot hold because from valid Bell inequalities we something that we expect to be a valid Bell inequality if the non-restriction hypothesis holds but we prove that this is not a valid Bell inequality so the non-restriction hypothesis cannot hold. Well, I will be here until Wednesday. You can ask me questions if you want. Okay. I know that. Uh, yes. So, summary. Because co from valid Bell inequalities for almost quantum correlations, we can get a potentially valid Bell inequality if the non-restriction hypothesis holds. 
and then we can prove that this inequality is not an inequality, it's violated by the, by the almost quantum It means that the non recessional hypothesis cannot hold for a theory given almost quantum relation. Hence, no GPT theory satisfying the non recessional hypothesis can reproduce almost quantum correlation. Okay, so it was long. I like almost quantum correlation, I think it's intriguing. I think one of the messages is like, if you come up with a principle for quantum correlations, test it against almost quantum before writing the paper. And it seems that a possible reason to uh, exclude this, if you believe in the non-restitution hypothesis, is that no, it's incompatible with this hypothesis. Okay. And I think this is interesting because then you can think of, okay, now you replace other information principles by the non-restitution hypothesis and see what it gives you. Okay. So does it this, this hypothesis play any significant role in singular outcome correlation? And then I didn't talk about it, but I think an interesting question is you know, this quantum boundary I was telling you about, it's even open whether this set of quantum correlations is decidable. So if I give you a point and I ask you whether these correlations are, I didn't say anything about this, but I like so much the problem that I put it here. So if you give me some correlations like the experimentalists and you ask me whether they are quantum, this problem in general might not be even Turing decidable. This is open at the moment. Okay. With this, this I conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>